thank you for inviting me to give a talk here. I'm pleased. It's nice to be back at the Azure S after a number of years. So I'm happy about that. So I, the title here is Discrete Minimal Surface Algebras. And I will try to describe a little bit what we've been doing over the last maybe 10 years or more uh, related to finding solutions to equations that somehow relate to minimal surface equations. I will tell you exactly what I mean by that. So it, we have taken a number of different approaches in different contexts and so on and I will try to, to, to outline these and also um, you'll see some hopefully some equations that you will see again and have already seen during this workshop. So what, what do we want to do? So we want to do discrete minimal surfaces, quantum minimal surfaces, non-commutative minimal surfaces, whatever you want to call it. And well, there are several motivations. First of all, as we've already seen today, I mean, some equations that you may not have realized that they were minimal surface equations appeared. And these kind of equations appear um, in physics, like the IKKT model we heard about, and also in membrane theory, um, in the matrix regularization. But also, there is a general mathematical interest, I think, to see in what, to act, what extent can we do non-commutative minimal surfaces. Is there some kind of nice theory, or is there nothing like the classical situation, or do we have some results? So what I'm talking about today is some joint work with a number of authors, like Jae Gyeong Che in Korea, and Jens Hoppe here, Gerd Hisken, and also at the end with Maxim Kontsevich. So some outline what I will do. Um, first of all, I will sort of um, tell you something about that you can formulate Kelly geometry in terms of Poisson brackets, right? Uh, a little bit like the previous talk you've seen and how that leads to, to equations for minimal surfaces written as Poisson bracket expressions. Then I will go to the, the, the paper which is, uh, I borrowed the title to this talk, which is discrete minimal surface algebras, trying to solve these equations, right? that you have in front of you. I will then do something slightly different but related. I will try to solve these equations in the Weyl algebra. So u and v are operators or algebra elements which commute to 1 and the xi's are the elements in the Weyl algebra you're trying to find to solve these equations. And then also I will end by saying something about a non-commutative catenoid and solving these equations, which you now recognize from the last talk, um, and connect that a little bit to the other two approaches. Um, so these type of equations have also been studied earlier, in particular the top one and the bottom one, um, by, for instance, by Kohn and Michel dubois Villet, and they call them Young-Mills algebras. And this is for the Young-Mills algebras and then some inhomogeneous Young-Mills algebras. So they been studied. I mean, in this talk, I will not focus so much on mathematical aspects of these algebras and so on, but I wanted to give you an overview of how we try to solve these equations. So, in order to motivate this, why these equations pop up, um, I would like to r quickly recall how we may formulate Kelly geometry in terms of the Poisson algebra generated by isometric embedding coordinates into some ambient space. So this is part of a, you can do this more generally. We, we wrote a number of papers here. Um, if you have an arbitrary n-dimensional Riemannian manifold, you can rewrite the, the geometry in terms of an n-bracket, a multilinear bracket instead. But for Keller manifolds, or para Keller and so on, almost Keller and so on, you can do it with Poisson brackets. So how do we do this? So, right, so on a Keller manifold, we know that the symplectic form or the Poisson structure is intimately related with the metric. And this compatibility um, you can write in many different ways. I've chosen to pick a particular way of writing it in local coordinates. So G is the metric tensor, G A B inverse. And then you have the Poisson bivector and then the, the metric here. And this equation holds on a Keller manifold where gamma is equal to 1. But I will keep gamma here because that's a degree of freedom that is um, convenient to have as we continue. What is gamma here? Right, gamma is for, I will, gamma is for the moment one. <laughs> I will show you on the next slide what, what I, why I put this gamma in, although for a Kelly manifold this one, okay? It has to do with the choice of Poisson bracket on your manifold. So, 
The claim is here that if the Poisson structure is compatible with the metric in this way, with gamma possibly being non-zero, you can reformulate all of German, uh, Riemannian geometry in terms of Poisson brackets of embedding coordinates into some ambient space. So that's the statement, we, and we do it explicitly in these papers. Now, so let's go to surfaces and embedded surfaces. And uh, for simplicity, we will choose the ambient space in which these surfaces are embedded to be Rm. Because that's simple, and of course we know we can always do it via Nash embedding theorem, and it will be the case uh, in our examples. Surface means two surfaces. Surface really means a two-dimensional real dimension surface, right, yeah. And so it's a surface which gets an induced metric from the Euclidean metric. Uh, and now for surfaces, if we take an arbitrary density row, we can introduce a Poisson bracket on the space of functions, like this. Now, there is of course a um, natural choice or canonical choice of this density, which is simply the square root of the determinant of the metric. <coughs> Maybe the Keller choice, one could call it. And now we introduce this gamma, which is the ratio of the square root of the determinant of the metric and this row you choose for the Poisson bracket. So it, it tells you how much your choice deviates from the Keller choice or whatever you want to say. So, and if you have this Poisson bracket um, in theta here, you, you really realize that you have this relation again, but now gamma doesn't have to be one. It could be something else. And now for surfaces, this is sort of just one another way of writing the cofactor expansion of the inverse of the metric is just a, um, this um, anti-symmetric sum of terms of the matrix elements of the matrix. So that's just an identity. Now, to come to minimal surfaces, let us apply this to the Laplace operator on the surface. So the Laplace Beltrami operator, we know how to write in local coordinates like this. And we can write it in uh, different ways. So I chose two different ways here. So the first way of writing it is with a Poisson bracket with the embedding coordinates, xi's, a double Poisson bracket. And here you see you have to introduce these gammas here. So if gamma is not one, you get these extra gammas. Yeah. Now, you can also write it in terms of the local coordinates on your surface. So u1 and u2, or u and v, as they will also be called, um, you can write the Laplace operator like this. Of course, you have sums over A and B here. Yeah. <coughs> okay, so some particular examples. When gamma is equal to one, it becomes particularly simple, right? Then it's just this double Poisson bracket equation for the Laplace operator in terms of the abetting coordinates. Now, um, if you have a conformal metric on your surface, just being proportional to the delta AB, the metric, and you choose rho to be equal to 1, that's the choice where the Poisson brackets of the local coordinates u and v is equal to 1, and you also get that gamma is square root of g is equal to this e, then the second formula on the previous slide, the formula which wrote the Laplace operator in terms of the embedding, uh, sorry, the local coordinates, it simply becomes this. So it's just proportional to the sum of two double Poisson brackets with one of the coordinates here and the other coordinate there. Yeah. Assuming uh, a conformal parametrization of your surface, right? So these are two equations that we will use to motivate what we introduce as non-commutative minimal surfaces. <coughs> so just a few remarks before we go on, just to see how it looks like. So, I claim that everything can be written now in terms of Poisson brackets of the embedding coordinates. How does it actually look like in practice, right? Well, for instance, if you have a surface, you can compute the Gaussian curvature in terms of the embedding coordinates, and the formula for the Gaussian curvature is this. Huh? So it's just a sum of products and iterated Poisson brackets. So that's how all these formulas look like, just to give you an idea. And of course, in terms of trying to find 
So that's one of the original motivations here, trying to find sort of how can we quantize these kind of geometrical systems? Well, we sort of know how to quantize them. If we can see things in terms of Poisson brackets, we can just replace them by commutators naively. So that was one of the original motivations for doing this. And, but of course, it, it has an independent interest as well. So just one more remark, not so much related to this talk, but one could of course now turn the question around. When you see that you have all these formulas for Riemannian geometry, um, written in terms of Poisson brackets of some generators xi, some embedding coordinates. You can ask, well, now if I start with a Poisson algebra, can I introduce Riemannian geometry in a consistent way in a Poisson algebra without referring to any underlying manifold? And I mean, we did this, I did this with a student. And yes, you can find some simple conditions for a Poisson algebra and that allows you to, to, to do Riemannian geometry in a Poisson algebra. So that's just a remark, but you can turn this, this question around, which is quite nice. Yes. So, um, with the help of these reformulations of the Laplace operator, and we would like to formulate the equations for, for a minimal surface. So, it's well known that for a minimal surfaces, surface in uh, Euclidean space, um, the equation so that you have for the embedding coordinates is simply that the Laplace operator on them is equal to zero. Right. So it's a, it's a harmonic embedding. And in terms of our Poisson bracket formulation, this is simply this equation. Of course, you'd say for i equals one to, to m here, that this should be zero but we can formulate it in this way, coming very close to the equation we saw uh, in the previous talk. Or we can choose another Poisson bracket where um, uh, we, the density was equal to one and not square root of g. And then we see that, well, the conformal fractal we had in front, one over e, doesn't matter if you want it to be zero. So, the, so it's actually not equal here, but proportional to this one. Um, you can formulate the um, condition that the surface is minimal in terms of the parameters u and v, like this. Hmm? And this is, of course, assuming that the metric is conformal, that these uh, tangent vectors here are orthogonal and have the same length. Okay. So, now... Also, we have been interested in um, equations that look similar to uh, minimal equations <coughs> describing minimal surfaces in spheres. I mean, these, these type of equations here, from a physical point of view, arose if you, if you try to do regularization of membrane theory, uh, time-dependent equations, you, you choose a particular gauge and you work and you end up with equations similar to this one that you have to solve. Now, these equations here, Laplace of xi equal to minus 2xi, these are equations that now you assume that the, the length of the vectors is 1, so you're in Sd minus 1, it should be d minus 1 up here as well. And if you're all on top of that, solve these equations, you know you have a minimal surface embedded in Sd minus 1. Also now written in terms of Poisson brackets. So. Now we want to take these equations, we want to replace Poisson brackets by commutators, and we want to study whether or not we can find solutions. Right? As, and by solutions I mean anything. Algebras, the algebras, matrices, operators, whatever. Try to find solutions. And what do we expect? Well, from these equations here, we expect something very rich already when d is equal to 4. Because when d is equal to 4, these equations are minimal surface equations for minimal surface in S3. Now, by a well-known paper by Lawson, we know that surfaces of arbitrary genus, minimal surfaces of arbitrary genus, uh, exist in S3. And of course, this equation should have all these kind of surfaces as solutions. And, of course, if you do some non-commutative version of this, you also expect somehow that you probably have a rich solution space. 
So already d equals 4 should show a rich structure. And you might also say that it, even for d equals 4 it might be impossible to solve the non-commutative equations completely because we will have so many objects lying around there. Yeah. But that's good because we want many objects to find examples. So now with this introduction, how you can rewrite the Laplace operator in terms of Poisson brackets and uh, look at the different types of minimal surface equations. Uh, let us now go to non-commutative or discrete versions um, by using, of course, this correspondence to define our objects. Why, why minus q? That's what you get. <laughs> That's what you get when you, when, you, when, you, when you derive the minimal surface equation in it's the dimension of the surface, too. Right, yeah. You have a Lagrange multiplier, and then you, you vary the equations, and, and you get something like that also, yeah, out. Um, so, um, this is um, an overview of one paper we wrote, which I borrowed the title of this talk, Discrete Minimal Surface Algebras. And those equations correspond to minimal surfaces in spheres, right? Now, we allow for this eigenvalue, or here, whatever you call it, it should be an i here, sorry, xi, of course, xi. This eigenvalue to be arbitrary. I mean, it was minus 2 on the last slide, but we, we just, to have some more room and flexibility, we allow for arbitrary values. And we call this collection of these mu i's the spectrum, um, just to have something to say. And we look at this equation as in different ways. So, of course, these equations make sense in a Lie algebra, right? You let x i's be elements of a Lie algebra, and you can make sense of this equation. So, that's one way of looking at this uh, um, equation, that given a Lie algebra and given a subset of elements, which I call curly x, you want this equation to be solved. Serial equation or complex equation? Yes. Um, doesn't matter, I mean, you mean over the complex or real numbers, the Lie algebra. Yeah, it doesn't matter so much now. It doesn't, right? Of course, when we later on maybe want to find representations with the exercise are Hermitian matrices, um, um, it, it matters. But here it doesn't matter. Mu i can be complex. Mu i can be complex just from the start, right? It will, of course, be real um, if you have Hermitian matrices or so on, and you take the take the conjugate to both sides, yeah. But for now, we just leave it complex. And, and also the, the multiplication, the multiplication of, uh, of the elements is normal multiplication or can you have a, a star product? Right now, there is no multiplication. Right now, it's just a Lie algebra. So the only multiplication you have is the Lie bracket, yeah. However, of course, now, the next thing to say is, of course, you can consider, I mean, sort of a, uh, an associative algebra, the associative free algebra on x1 to xm, you generate an ideal by this relation and you quote out and you get an algebra, an associative algebra, right? So that's of course like the enveloping algebra of your Lie algebra. That's one other way of looking at these equations. Maybe if you want to find some kind of basis and so on and use the diamond lemma and all these things, it's quite useful to do that, right? So I was thinking of a Q bracket over there and uh, well, imp we wanted to find this, we really wanted to find operators, so then it's not, so no but of course you could consider these equations, you could have any bracket, it doesn't even have to be maybe Jacobi identity or I don't know, but if that's interesting or not, I don't know. Right, so, so you can do several algebraic things with these objects and of course, um, Con and dubois villet for, for the case where this is zero on the right hand side, they put a lot of properties like causal and so on and homological properties of these algebras. As I said, I will focus on solutions to these equations. So, what kind of solutions we have? Well, we have, for instance, Clifford algebra solutions now. Going away from the Lie algebra solutions I just mentioned, you will see them later on. So if I have a Clifford algebra satisfying these relations here, um, I can easily see that and check that, well, if you do this sum here, you will end up with something proportional to EI again. Now this, this commutator is 
really the commutator, of course, not the anti-commutator, then you would just have zero, right? So it's really the commutator. So representations of Clifford algebras, if you want, or just Clifford algebras as they are, um, solve these equations. So Lie algebras, maybe perhaps more natural as written. Well, if you take an orthonormal basis with respect to the Killing form of a semi-simple Lie algebra, then you can easily see that the xi's are solutions to the equations simply because um, the double commutator is the product of two structure constants and they will just be the killing form if they're also normal so you have a solution. Now of course um, let us look just a little bit more in detail on some other solutions you get from the algebras and let us look at SLN here just to have something concrete to look at. <coughs> so SLN you have alpha 1 to alpha n minus 1 being simple roots and uh, we have to choose some kind of, of, of uh, basis here so we choose elements E alpha E minus alpha and H alpha to satisfy these commutation relations quite a normal choice of basis and where these H alphas are part of the Cartan subalgebra mm, fulfilling that this linear functional and H is just this inner product with respect to the killing form and uh, in SLN all roots have the same length, so let us call this L squared the length of our root. Okay? And now having these roots we can just take the plus and minus combinations of the negative and positive root like this. And these elements will now fulfill nice double commutator relations. Okay? So you actually get this. Maybe not so important exactly what you get here, but you see, if I take one of these E alpha, it's commuted with E beta twice, and I get something back which is proportional to E alpha plus again. Now, this is, of course, alpha plus or minus beta has to be a root here. So what happens, of course, is that E alpha with E beta gives you the root E alpha plus beta, then you get the term when you subtract beta again, and you go back to alpha. So there is no mystery here. And so you can compute all these, um, not so interesting. Um, so what can we do here? So there are many ways now of choosing subsets of these things to get solutions to the equations. For instance, you can choose uh, positive roots like this. I think even you can choose the, the signs to be independent. And in this case, every commutator like this will be proportional to xi again for all these elements here. Hmm? That's one way of constructing solutions. There are other ways. For instance, here you include some elements of the Cartan subalgebra and take uh, every root with a plus and a minus like this. And uh, now it's no longer true that every double commutator is proportional to, to the element again, but things cancel and work out here. So you get solutions um, to the double commutator equation where it acts on the Cartan subalgebra as being zero and not on the Cartan subalgebra it has some other eigenvalues yeah so just to give some examples that there are many ways of of choosing these elements to get solutions so now let us consider the case when d is equal to four remember that d is equal to four you have four operators or four algebra elements um, and that you know, there were co um, equations corresponding to minimal surfaces in S3, which we expect to be rich already. So, and then we do some simplifications here. So we assume that at least two of these um, eigenvalues are equal and the other two are also equal. We call them mu and rho here. And we complexify these uh, matrices, Hermitian matrices, xi um, as lambda, and t. Now of course you don't have to talk about matrices, you could equally well talk about uh, star algebra or so on, but we talk about matrices to be concrete, that was also an original motivation for, for doing this. Now you just rewrite the double commutator equation in terms of these new variables and you get some expression like this. Um, what you can note here is that things drastically simplify if lambda and t are normal operators, 
Now, normal operators means that lambda lambda dagger and tt dagger commute, so this term goes away, and these two terms here are actually equal, and these two terms are also equal, and this goes away. So you just have one term on the right-hand side. That's so it can make things simpler. So what do we do? Well, when lambda is normal, we don't assume t to be normal for now. We assume lambda to be normal because it's unitarily diagonalizable. So we can find a basis such as um, always find a basis where lambda is diagonal. And then let me show you how we think of the solutions to these equations in terms of a directed graph, which turns out to be useful. So, what do I mean? Well, it, it's like the adjacency matrix of a graph, right? Um, you let G uh, with vertex set V and edge set E be a directed graph, and the vertices are the eigenvalues of lambda, okay? And there is an edge between these eigenvalues if and only if the corresponding matrix element of T is non-zero, okay? So, the graph encodes the eigenvalues of lambda, that's drawing the, the, the graph in the complex plane, where the eigenvalues are the vertices, and then you just look at t and you draw the edges from the respective eigenvalues to get this graph. So although, of course, this graph, as depicted here, does not encode the value of the matrix elements of t, it sort of encodes the structure which turns out to be useful. So this is just an example that we'll see later. So this, I mean, we use this simple representation of solutions to matrix equations in a number of different situations where it was uh, very useful um, in some papers here. For instance, in this paper here, it was crucial to, to sort of classify all possible finite dimensional Hermitian representations of some cubic algebras, right? So, which was much more tricky to do without graphs than with graphs. So, if you, you can ask questions like, if I have some equations and I have a graph of this type, what kind of uh, restrictions do I have on my graph coming from the equations? Can I derive rules for my graph to be a solution and so on? Yeah, um, so, the fuzzy sphere solved these equations, right? So this up here is just a concrete representation um, of SU2 here um, with some a choice of normalization, which you see here. And this is a solution, which actually these are equal to 2 here. Um, for lambda is equal to that, which is already diagonal, and T is equal to this matrix. And now if we just depict it in our graphical way, it will be a simple string um, like this, where the eigenvalues of lambda are just these real values on the real line, and then we just connect them one by one, like that. Now these equations also have a rotational symmetry, which I didn't talk so much about, so you can, if you want, you can rotate these eigenvalues from the real line to go out in the complex plane, if you want. Um, but you can get other solutions from SU2, right? So for instance, you can, for arbitrary complex numbers, Z and W, you can construct these two matrices, uh, which have um, different eigenvalues related to these, of course, and a different type of representation graph here. And they're not equivalent, these representations, so they're different. Now, the fuzzy torus um, is also a solution, so it's generated by Matrices G and H, which have this commutation relation, that those are the clock and shift matrices we know. Um, now this is a, a rational root of unity here, so Q to the sum N is equal to 1. And you get a solution by in principle taking G and H here, just to be lambda and T, and G is the diagonal clock matrix, and H is the shift matrix, and this gives you a solution to the equations, with this eigenvalue here, depending on Q, and it looks like, the graph looks like this. Huh? Those are just, of course, the N different roots of unity here. Now, 
of course, now you start wondering here, now these equations, they contain, should contain um, solutions which correspond to surfaces of arbitrary genus in S3. Of course, the torus here has genus 1, and we saw the fuzzy sphere has genus 0. Of course, you would like to find um, solutions, maybe explicit solutions, of arbitrary genus, right? This is, in general, a tricky problem to find explicit things of higher genus, but they should be here somewhere. And um, we don't understand this uh, completely um, at all. And I mean, maybe it's also very difficult because there are so many solutions in here. Um, but let us try something else here. So let us take SL3 <coughs> and let us take the, this T1 to be an element of the Cartan subalgebra, typically the ones we choose to be diagonal matrices. That's also lambda is phi of T1, where phi is a representation of SL3 by anti Hermitian matrices. Now, if you take these, these two elements and you just compute that, you get a solution of the equations with these eigenvalues here. And of course, you can write down, for instance, if phi is the n, zero highest weight representation, um, you recognize the weight diagram, of course, of, of this kind of representation. Um, and this is n equals 3, perhaps. And then you have to look at this matrix here to see how they are all connected with directed arrows. So not so important. But and of course, you can go on. You can take now this uh, n to infinity limit, and you get a sequence of, of matrices somehow inside SL3 um, with perhaps some limit. Um, this I don't know. Yeah. <coughs> so here, so to conclude here, it says it is not it is not so difficult to find um, explicit solutions that you can actually work with for these equations, which might be useful in I don't know in physics or not. And, but it's surely interesting that you have this structure in mathematics and you can say, you can actually say a lot more here, uh, general about the representation theory and the connection between graphs and representations and irreducible, not irreducible and, and so on, which I've chosen not to present. So you're assuming Q is not plus to one. Uh, because T, Q, Q, because mu is equal to zero if Q is equal to one. No, Q is not equal to one, that's right. Uh, by the way, I mean, what you construct here is a projection of CP2, fuzzy CP2. Okay. Yeah, okay, yeah, this could be interesting, yeah. Hmm? So, so, so what happens, uh, have you considered uh, the case of uh, BPS kind of uh, solutions, meaning that you also have these num equations? With the extra term sort of stabilizing? Uh, no. no, I suppose solutions that also satisfy the num equation, meaning that uh, they have this commutator equal to uh, epsilon i j k times, you know. Right, equal to... Um, Restrictive is this. Uh, uh, or, or you, you, the commutator, the sum of commutators x i, x, x i, x j or something like that, squared, uh, yeah. Multiplied by epsilon is not the solution. Um, no, I haven't looked. I mean, the fuzzy sphere, yes, I think, right? But, but um, this, I don't know, I don't know. Okay, so now that was one set of equations to solve. Now let me proceed to another set of equations which are maybe not directly relevant for physics as equations, but still very interesting. And you can actually prove more for these equations. And those are the, the non-commutative minimal surfaces which we look for in the Weyl algebra um, when you wrote the Laplace operator in terms of local coordinates. So. We return to the equations defining a minimal surface as an Rm, and we think of having a parameterized minimal surface in R3, and we know that the minimal surface equations can be written like this if the metric is conformal, and, and recall here that the this choice of Poisson bracket was u with v is equal to 1. And the question we had is what happens if we naively uh, translate these equations into non-commutative algebras. Do we get something non-trivial? Do we send something simple or not? Can we find solutions? And so 
how, how do we think about this? Well, we know we can find a lot of explicit parameterized non-commutative and minimal surface in, in R3. That's a classical subject. So we thought maybe we can actually find analogs uh, of these surfaces. Um, right, that's what I said. We, we, in terms of physics, we may not solve the more relevant physics equation, but maybe this will help us to understand what to expect from the other equations. And also, it turns out to be a nice, um, nice theory in itself here. So, what do we do? Since, since the classical Poisson bracket is 1, we start with uh, an algebra generated by u and v satisfying that the commutator is equal proportional to 1. This is the Weyl algebra. We denote it by a h bar. And we also, for more technical reasons, you can say we need this fraction field. I mean, where you consider also all the inverses of elements, polynomials in u and v. And now we start from an extremely naive um, definition. Not very elegant, but very naive and very close to the classical situation. Now, what do we do? Well, we take some tuple of um, elements in the Weyl algebra, or if you want, we take an element of the free module of rank n over the fraction field. Remember, the fraction field is not so important. We will later see that we can find solutions in the Weyl algebra itself, but to make the general statements, we need a fraction field. So we, we call it a non-commutable minimal surfaces if they are all, um, all uh, Hermitian, real in some sense. They satisfy the minimal surface equation, but we remember that this minimal surface equation only holds if we have a conformal parametrization. So with the help of um, derivatives here, we write down these conditions very naively. So what's du and dv? Well, they are simply the commutators with v and u, which in the classical situations where you have the Poisson bracket are exactly the derivatives with respect to u and v. But here we have them in the, uh, as inner derivations in the algebra. We write down this fact that the length of x prime u and x prime v are the same. And the fact that the off-diagonal terms, they are orthogonal. So you have this equal to zero, somewhat symmetrized to be a real condition. And these two f's are same? That fraction? The two f's are the same, thank you, yes. I use different typeset. Um, right, so these are the equations we want to solve. We want to find x size, hmm? n elements of the Weyl algebra for which this is true. You could imagine doing a, a lot of fancy algebraic things here. You could define, oh, this is the algebra generated by these xi's, completed to, to include all the possible derivatives of the xi's and so on. Yes, but this is not the route I want to take. I want to show you theorems about solutions. So and this is actually what you get here. A non-commutative Weierstrass theorem. So recall for those of you who don't remember, Weierstrass representation theorem tells you how you can write every minimal surface in R3. Okay? So it goes two ways. So first of all, um, you say here, well, you choose two elements f and g. Now, they need to be holomorphic, and here we, we write that, so d bar f and d bar g is equal to zero, where d and d bar are just the complex combinations of du and dv, as usual. Um, so you take such, and so if you think about this, these are quotients of polynomials in lambda only and not lambda dagger. You take these and <coughs> you write down x1, x2, x3 like this. Now, F, now, this integration is just the antiderivative of polynomials, right? So there is nothing fancy going on here. If so, if you can integrate these polynomials here, um, you know that these elements satisfy this Laplace equation and also this, this restriction that you need the parametrization to be conformal. So this gives an, a way to generate infinitely many explicit solutions to the equations in the algebra. Um, thank you. I didn't write lambda. Lambda is u plus iv. Let me just write that on the board, so thanks. Should of course have been here. Thank you. So lambda is the complex combination of u and v, and um, we write everything in terms of lambda and the real part. So that's where you get a mix of all the lambdas and uh, u's and v's and so on when you write it out. 
Okay, so it's nice that you can generalize the wire stress representation without change, more or less, to the non-commutative setting. Um, so, one more thing. So, of course, the, the non-trivial part is not to show that this is a solution, perhaps, but the other way around, that all solutions can be written this way in the Weyl algebra. Yeah. <coughs> there is another classical representation um, theorem which tells you how to obtain minimal surfaces. And this is the following, and this representation formula just depends on choosing one polynomial or quotient of polynomials, f in lambda, like this, and construct this one. Then if you sort of integrate these phi 1, phi 2, phi 3 as xi's, you get a minimal surface. Just another way, also usually in a, in a book about minimal surfaces, you find this. And so, given any polynomial, you find a minimal surface here. And for instance now, let me go to some examples. You can find uh, non-commutative versions of the Ennepe surface. That's, this one is constructed this way. Right, so we choose, in principle, we choose f to be just lambda to some power, right? And then we just write down, what will this be? Well, you can integrate that explicitly and you just get the real part of these things. Of course, as usual, I didn't say, but the real part is just, I mean, one half the element plus its, of course, Hermitian transpose, yeah. Um, now, n equals 3 corresponds to the Ennepe surface, right? Um, in a parameter, uh, yes. And now, you see, when you write this out, you recognize sort of, if you recognize the parametrization of the Ennepe surface as you find it in Wikipedia or in some book, you will, of course, recognize this part here this but without the h bars and this part here now. Of course, what this theorem provides you is the sort of non-trivial correction terms that you have to do in order to compensate for the non-commutativity. So this theorem gives you these correction terms automatically if you want to look at it that way. So unless these corrections are here, it will not satisfy the equations. Of course, you can go on and produce a lot more examples, so it's really you can produce an infinite number of explicit examples, if you like. Okay. So, let's, okay, just... Uh, so, um, now, before going to the next part, um, you can wonder a little bit here. Now, if I have my non-commutative minimal surface in this setting, right? Or if I have it in the other setting, with the commutators with the x's, I mean, of course, classically, they are equivalent. You can solve the equations in local coordinates, you can write them in, in, the, um, in the embedding coordinates, and they are equivalent. And we have many, many solutions to this setting, right? Can we use them to produce solutions to the other setting, which perhaps contain the more relevant physical equations, now that we have so many examples here? Yeah, of course, classically it's a change of coordinates, but non-commutative in the non-commutative world is not as simple. But we tried. We have tried and we have succeeded um, to some extent. So, and that's this next part here together with Jens and, and Maxime, um, which we are writing up now. Uh, we did the following. So, let me be a little bit more precise about the things I just said. So. If we have this Poisson bracket here with the sort of natural 1 over square root of g uh, factor, we get the uh, um, uh, minimal surface equations to be this. And if we have this Poisson bracket with just a 1 here, we get this. Hmm? Now, the two are related by a change of coordinates. Um, right, so this comment is what I just said. We want to produce solutions to the top equation from the bottom equation um, in the non-commutative setting as well. So, assume that we have a parametric minimal surface and assume that we sort of reparametrize these in terms of u tilde and v tilde, which has a Jacobian which is just equal to the um, square root of g here. Now, for a Poisson bracket where the u tilde and v tilde, the Poisson bracket is 1, um, you get that these x's now solve this equation, right? So, uh, in terms of u and v, it didn't solve, it solved the other equation in terms of the parameters, but if we reparameterize this way, you solve this equation, which we want to solve. So, 
Can we make use of this in the non-commutative setting? And let's consider the case of the catenoid hmm? uh, embedded in R3. How can we do this? Okay, so let us recall what's the catenoid. Well, we parameterize the catenoid in R3, for instance, in the following way, with caution, uh, hyperbolic functions and trigonometric functions. And we introduce W to be the complex combination of these, and it's just being equal to that. Now, we can explicitly do the reparametrization we talked about on the previous slide by setting u tilde to be u and v tilde to be these, this function of v alone. You easily check that you get the, the Jacobian to be the correct one. And now you have these w's and z being functions of u's and u tilde with this, these functions inside here. And of course one would have to invert this up here to get this. Now, so what have we obtained here? Well, what we have, we have obtained is a sort of a, a parametrization in terms of the variables u and u tilde which have Poisson bracket 1. That's the main difference, right? In the, pre, in the other case, we didn't know what the Poisson bracket of u and v was, or maybe 1 over square root of g. And we don't know, maybe we don't know what to do with that in the non-commutative setting. But in this setting, u and v, u tilde, v tilde have Poisson bracket 1 which sort of make them easy to quantize in some sense. So now we want to take these expressions and just replace u tilde and v tilde by operators that commute to one, more or less, right? So, so in analogy with sort of standard representations of, of um, operators which commute to one, and we let them, in this case, we let them act on uh, sorry for the Fourier modes on the circle, like this. This is really just a motivation for how we now make the answers to solve the equations, right? We see that this e to the i u tilde shifts just one step and this v tilde is diagonal this way, right? So, we make the following ansatz for w and z. Um, w is just something, whatever, shifting one step z is a diagonal operator and it corresponds to these ones, the functions, right? So this one, the e to the i u tilde would just shift one step and whatever this is will be just diagonal, so that's the right ansatz and this z will just be diagonal. Now remember that w is x1 plus i x2, so and z is x3, so we want these three operators which satisfy these double commutator equations. Now we just plug things in. And you notice that these equations now, in terms of this, just becomes these two equations here, as written. Hmm? And uh, then you plug in the ansatz, <coughs> right? And as you expect, these, the equations you get will be equations for these wn and the zn, which define our operators. Now we write it in terms of the modular squared of wn, which we call rn, and then zn is the zn on the previous page. So if we think of the w's and z to be operators in sort of the, the doubly infinite Fox space, just the states labeled by an integer going from minus infinity to infinity, um, these are the recursion relations we get for the, the action on the different states of, of w and z. And uh, we can solve these recursion relations. Yeah. So we immediately note here that you see, this is just, this equation shifted one step, right? So this combination here will be constant for all n's, and that's what we call c here. So we immediately see that. And now you can just solve the recursion relation by, by picking some initial values and then doing the recursion in both directions. Now the only slightly non-trivial thing is that, of course, we have to keep rn positive in order to solve for Wn at the end. So we have to prove that these recursion relations, they preserve positivity. And they do so for a specific set of initial conditions. So R0 is positive. You choose some C, which was this combination of, which was constant we noted on the last slide. And you choose R1 to be between R0 and R0 plus something constructed out of C and R0. So you have a range in which you're allowed to choose R1 to 
get a solution. And this is to guarantee positivity of R. And then you just simply, you take this, you do the forward recursion for n bigger than or equal to 2, or the backwards recursion for n less than or equal to minus 1, and you just get everything in terms of R0 and R1. And you can do the same thing for Z here, and you get all the Zs. So given the initial conditions, you get a unique solution, and this solution satisfies that the Rns are positive, and you can define the following operators. Um, you can always include a phase here, but it's not important. You can, you can, by unitary transformation, you can remove it, so there is nothing here. So in principle, you get these operators now. So, remember, from our general ansatz here to the double commutator equations, Remember, this was just a motivation to get this ansatz. So this ansatz had really, from the look of it, nothing to do with the catenoid, really. It's just a, some ansatz motivated by the catenoid. And we get solutions, which we have down here. Now, how do these solutions look like? Do they have anything to do with, with the classical functions defining the catenoid? Well, um, Mm, they do somehow. So you can just plot this recursion relation for some initial values, right? And this is Rn, you plot here, which is more or less the, the, the square of Wn. And here is the Zn, going like this. And if you plot the corresponding functions, I didn't do that here, um, you have a quite nice match of the behavior. So really Rn and Zn seems to be more or less disc discretizations of the functions of the catenoid, although that was not really how they were constructed. It turns out that the solutions are exactly <coughs> like that. And in the things we are writing up now, there are more interesting relations between the initial conditions and the parameters when you define the catenoid, you can, you can shift the phase a little bit, you can multiply everything by a constant, you can do all these kind of things, and they seem to have a corresponding freedom, uh, sorry, a corresponding um, notion in the non-commutative world. And there's also interesting to note that there is some choice here of R1 between R0 and this value, which sort of seems to be some sort of non-commutative effect here, that you're allowed to choose some non-commutativity in this thing. Um, because in, in, in the classical case, this is a symmetric function here, which is it's not here, it's not symmetric. But for certain values of the initial conditions, you get something symmetric. Okay, so, okay, before I summarize. <coughs> so, what did we do? Well, we looked at um, um, a catenoid in some parameters which was not really correspond to the equations we want to solve. We looked at how to do a, a coordinate transformation in the classical case, and we thought, of, can we implement this in the non-commutative case by this procedure? And the catenoid is not the only example. It seems like we can do the same kind of reasoning to obtain solutions to the double commutator equations, even for, even for other um, uh, surfaces, minimal surfaces. So it seems like, to some extent, this would help us to, to find solutions. <coughs> so, just to summarize, um, what I, I try to give an overview of what we've done um, different approaches to non-commutative discrete quantum minimal surfaces here. Um, and they are, these equations are motivated both from physics, uh, as we've seen, and, but also from mathematics, because I think it's an interesting question to what extent uh, these objects exist and have nice properties in the non-commutative world. Um, and in particular, I presented these two different ways, one in terms of the divide algebra and the other one in terms of just the x's. Uh, to obtain equations for minimal surfaces. And one may find solutions, many solutions, and in the Weyl algebra one even can sort of, in some cases, classify all solutions, like with the Weierstrass representation, so you have infinitely many explicit non-commutative minimal surfaces that you can write down. And at the end I try to present an idea how to sort of connect these a little bit, how to go from one to the other. Is it possible in the non-commutative setting? It seems like yes, in some cases you can actually do this to obtain non-commutative minimal surfaces which solve the more relevant physical equations. And that was it. Thank you very much.
Yeah, and if you can go back to this uh, slide when you choose the complex structure W equals to, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, is this is it here? No, no. After that, uh, after that, uh, uh, yeah. The, is it the reminiscent of self duality in the kind of Young Mills case? Means, is it the can we interpret this Z W W dagger as some self dual equation and the other one as an anti self dual? Oh, because it's in Young Mills. In a I I'm I'm sorry. I'm not a physicist, so I don't have a good question answer. But after choice of this W equal to x one plus i x two. Is after choice of the complex structure, can we keep up with it? Sorry, I, I don't know. <laughs> no, 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 no the, but the answer is no. This is just in the rewriting the equation. It's There's just no self-duality. Yeah. Yes, the yeah. question here. Um, so in the case of three Hermitian matrices, precisely this equation, so uh, how close are you to having a complete understanding of all solutions of these things? All solutions of these equations or the catenoid case? No. With three matrices, and may maybe with a mass on the right hand side, I don't know. Um, with three matrices, um, this equation, um, no, not the general. I mean, for the corresponding equation in the Weyl algebra, some sort of a complete understanding, but here, no. Yeah, it, I mean, all these, morally speaking, all these solutions should be here somehow lurking around, right? All these minimal surfaces. Yeah. Yes. Right. Two questions. So <clears throat> the, you said it says, uh, you were taking a field, a vial field. I'm not an expert. So did, is this just vial algebra localized in, with respect to some multiplicative sets? Or? Localized. I mean, it's a total fraction field. For the vial algebra, you can construct a total fraction field. Yeah. Yeah, so you write just quotient of polynomials, right, you get. You can show that these OR conditions are satisfied for if you take the complete algebra to localize at the complete algebra and you can show that these conditions are fulfilled and you can construct by this or localization you can construct the quotient field yeah have you found second question have you thought of uh, taking say other uh, nice converging sub algebras of, of star sub -algebras? for instance on, on on the sphere you can there's uh, explicit star products on the upper half plane, there are explicit star products which are converging on some class of functions. To construct solutions, that's what you mean, yeah. yeah. I mean, well, of course, the Weyl algebra is, is the simplest choice, simplest one. Yeah, right. Um, well, you would, I mean, if you, if you work like this, you would like really you, um, oh, you mean having a, an algebra with still keeping u commutator v is equal to 1, but allowing for more, uh, more functions in there, apart from polynomials. No, that was not your... u commutator would, would sometimes uh, be the Weyl algebra. Right? right, right, yeah. Oh, some, some other... I mean, you uh, think of the sphere as well, you have three functions and, and right. rotation identities like... And, uh, yeah, I mean, yes, I mean, maybe you would have to go to S3. I mean, for the ordinary sphere, maybe you don't get so much interesting, like, because it's already a two-dimensional manifold, so you would have minimal surfaces in the two-sphere, which is, yeah, I don't know really what that would mean. But you can, you can imagine having, introducing more elements in the Weyl algebra, for instance, I mean, I know, for instance, Stefan Waldmann uh, constructed a, sort of a, a, a much larger algebra, uh, including a lot of more smooth elements of the Weyl algebra, not just the polynomials. And of course, you can work in such an algebra also. In this case, if, if you want to define the catenoid in the Weyl algebra, of course, you cannot directly do it because you don't have access to the cosh of u, right? But in this, this lo much larger algebra, you could imagine doing it, yeah. For my uh, culture, uh, if I'm interested in the quantum uh, string, uh, is there a link between quantum solutions of uh, the string and what you would do in Lorentzian manifold for the string worksheet? Connection with the minimal? Yes, I mean, a string worksheet, a classical equation of a string is a minimal. Right, right, thing. yeah. So if I'm interested in quantum so strings, real quantum strings. Right. State. Yeah, so 
you should not you, sh you should not <laughs> really ask me I, I okay. I'm not a yeah. physicist but that one of the points was of course to see to try to provide explicit solutions to these yeah, the classical right. equations to try to understand may maybe perhaps more the quantum version of the strings and so on but this I, I don't know much about okay so thank you again. thank you much <laughs>